Good day. Hi, this is Mr. JV C. Dizon and I thank you for being with me today as I discuss with you one of the most important aspects in education, and that is going to be the pedagogical and andragogical trends and issues and their impacts in the classroom practice. In the previous meeting, we were able to understand and identify already the difference of pedagogy and andragogy. However, in this discussion, we are to identify and address the impact of the trends and issues of pedagogy and andragogy to our practice as educators and as curriculum developers. Firstly, let's tackle first a short backgrounder on pedagogy and andragogy. In the beginning was pedagogy, to which we know how andragogy has been established. The pedagogical model has been first established between the 7th to 12th centuries. It is from the Greek word which means the art and science of teaching children. It has focused mainly on teaching children as its main difference with andragogy. Andragogy, therefore, is the teaching of adult learners. Most of the foundation of the pedagogical model, according to Malcolm Knowles, is founded on the assumptions, on different observations on the teaching of reading and writing, which are very simple skills of that. This has been the model which has been prominently used in secular schools and universities around Europe and America in 18th and the 19th centuries. With much of the educational setting having to base teachers' instruction is on the pedagogical model, which focuses on the didactic teaching, there arise issues on the varying needs of the learners much more to our adult learners. The pedagogical model works as if it's the banking model, if you're familiar with the model, to which that model tries to situate the learners as if they are empty glasses to be filled upon with knowledge by the teacher. So in that model, the teacher acts as the main source of knowledge in the classroom. The student's role is passive in this instruction, and their role is to fill themselves up with the knowledge that the curriculum will provide them. This has been deliberately applied in the teaching of adult learners. So there seems to be a lack of contextualization in the instruction for adults. So according to Knowles, adult learners deem the pedagogical instruction insufficient. Insufficient in a way that, as what I've said a while ago, whatever is applied for children's uh, learning instruction is also applied for adult learners' instruction in the classroom. So in this instruction in the pedagogical model, it has only involved didactic teaching or the didactic approach, which has spoon feeding with designed readings, drills, quizzes, and examinations, which I think are only promoting rote memorization, to which we have another aspect for learners, for adult learners at that, and they have another reason or purpose for learning. So rote memorization might not be applicable for the purpose that they have before they enter the classroom. Later on, uh, maybe we can try to contextualize that and how adult learners are in the classroom. So I, I guess that adult learners as well are problem-centered in that, in that situation. The notion into pedagogical model is to make students learn what the curriculum ought them to learn, and that's applicable for children. The children are deemed to be a blank slate in the learning process, which directly benefits them from the pedagogical model. So in that case, if that's the case for children, it might not be the same for adults. So there was a need for, for a change. There was a need to accommodate the, the necessity which differs from children because adults, they, they do not come in uh, in the classroom to be given instruction and to be guided by the teacher. They come into the classroom because they have already established a purpose and they have already established a reason uh, for their own learning to which they would want to apply those learning as immediately as possible. Based on our previous discussions on andragogy and pedagogy, we have here Alfred North Whitehead, who has established the proposition that education as a process of transmittal, which is reflected on pedagogy, is only valid if the time span of social change is longer than the lifespan of an individual. 
this is highly contradictory to the picture shown in this slide. It is expected that what was taught according to Whitehead, that whatever is learned in the years of an individual, in his or her life, those will be applicable all throughout the individual's lifetime. And that that is the assumption for the pedagogical model. However, that proposition does not take into account the social and cultural changes brought about by the differing generations, which also bring different advancement on technology, politics, and social aspects that affect education. In this picture, one could infer that whatever is learned in the 25th year may no longer be productive after 15 years, more so from the 40th year after 30 more years. Advancements have changed the skills that are expected of the learners, and the curriculum has continuously changed to adapt to the learning needs of the different generations, considering the different factors. Hence, the educational setting changes the expected competencies and has let the educational setting be set on a lifelong inquiry instead of just feeding the learners of the curriculum itself. Then came andragogy. Andragogical model was manifested into our instruction as teachers because there was a necessity to accommodate the learning needs of adult learners. And that has first resembled in the Journal of Adult Education in 1948. So there were published articles on teachers' practices deviating from the pedagogical model, and there were a glimpse of a sense of guilt from those teachers who published those articles because whatever they've uh, used as an approach in their classroom instruction were not mainly based on a theory. So what they were doing were, was that they were trying to be pragmatic. They were trying to look for um, necessary changes to which would accommodate the learning needs of adult learners, which are, again, from the pedagogical model, most of the needs addressed there are only for young learners. But also, we can also try to make use of the pedagogical model for adult learners, but only for specific situations. In the 1960s, there was scientific research on adult learning by Cyril O. Hu, and the study has found that there are three subgroups for adult learners. We have goal-oriented learners, activity-oriented learners, and learning-oriented learners. And secondly, we have um, the increase in numbers of teachers experimenting with concepts of andragogy, which thereby provides two alternative models fit in the situations. We can now argue about the question, which one is better? Actually, none of the two is actually better than the other. Because, once again, the pedagogical model can be used when the situation is appropriate for adult learners and the same goes for young learners. While andragogical model can also be used and applied for young learners, should there be a situation that begs the necessity of the application of that model. Because young learners may be independent as well and they would rather want to uh, have a teacher just facilitate the instruction and likewise, uh, is applied for adult learners. Sometimes adult learners would also want the guide of the teachers themselves in the classroom instruction or in the discussion. We now proceed with Knowles' five assumptions of adult learners. In 1980, Knowles has given us four assumptions on the characteristics of adult learners and ha that has become the basis for andragogy. And based on Malcolm Knowles' uh, principles and assumptions, and the andragogical model has been made prominent in the classroom instruction for universities and in different schools. And in 1984, Knowles has been able to add the fifth assumption. And here are the following assumptions as uh, presupposed by Malcolm Knowles. In the 1980, he was able to discuss that there are four assumptions. And the four assumptions are that as individuals mature, their self-concept moves from one of being a dependent personality toward being a self-directed human being, to which he established that adult learners are actually independent in their learning uh, situations. Secondly, they accumulate a growing reservoir of experience that becomes an increasingly rich resource for learning. So in the adult learner experience, the teacher is not only the main source of knowledge, 
Rather, the students themselves, the adult learners themselves, are actually resources of information in the classroom setting. Thirdly, we have the readiness to learn. As a person matures, his or her readiness to learn becomes oriented increasingly to the developmental tasks of his or her social roles. Later on, we will be discussing the developmental tasks uh, as stipulated by a proponent. So in the in the in that third aspect, they try to determine their learning situated as well on their social roles in reality or in real life contexts. And fourth, we have their time perspective changes from one of postponed application of knowledge to immediacy of application, and accordingly, their orientation toward learning shifts from one of subject centeredness to one of perform performance. Centeredness. In this case, the orientation of learning of the adult learners is very different to how children are in their learning. Because for children, they apply what they learned only when they uh, acquire the next level. Say, for example, for grade school learners, whatever they've learned from the grades from their grade school will be applied and we will be their basis for when they become secondary school learners. Same goes with how college learners are. Based on what they've learned on the secondary level, that will become the basis for their skills. So most probably there is an articulation of maybe vertical and uh, horizontal articulation of those skills in the different grade levels. But for adult learners, when they come into the classroom, they expect that what they learn from the one hour, most probably they will be able to apply immediately after they come out of the classroom. And they would apply that, of course, on their respective social roles, coming back to their respective developmental tasks, which is later on will be discussed to you as detailed as possible. And finally, we have the fifth one, which is motivation to learn. As a person matures, the motivation to learn is internal. That is from Knowles in 1984. And most probably... The children have an extrinsic motivation to which they acquire rewards and reinforcements from adult learners themselves. And those try to those rewards and reinforcements try to establish whatever attitude or behavior that they have. So it, which means that they have to perpetuate and lengthen that attitude and behavior because that's probably what they need. But for adults, when they try to learn, most probably, as what is said in the previous slides, adults come into your class and they expect already and they have already established a sense of purpose for what they are going to learn in your discussion. And those five assumptions of the characteristics of adult learners for andragogy have clearly an implication to our practice as teachers and curriculum developers. We now proceed with the first assumption, the concept of the learner and its implication to classroom practice. We have here four implications, the learning climate, the diagnosis of needs, and the conducting learning experiences, likewise for evaluation of learning. So in the learning climate, it's not just the environment inside the classroom the teacher has to address, but rather also the psychological climate of the classroom setup. This is a very important implication to consider because we are now facing the pandemic and we have transferred from the on from from the traditional setting to the online class setup. So we suffer uh, as teachers also suffer from 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 this setup, but also much of the sufferings and the sacrifice would have been in the end of our dear students. So which is why we also have to consider the psychological climate of our instruction or our classroom or in our discussions because our students still are trying to put up with their emotional maturity compared with us adults. Moreover, the self-concept of the young learners are encouraged to be uh, guided by adults for young learners. Much of what is taught for young learners are based on their biological function. And we consider the, really the guidance of the young learners that comes from the adults. Because for young learners, uh, their full-time occupation is to be learners themselves. And they are rewarded with uh, reinfor reinforcements from, from adults. But in the case of adult learners, 
much of what they do is that they would want to be de- independent with their own learning. So in that case, if they would want to be independent most of the time in their own learning, we also have to let them diagnose their needs, which is why it is very important as a practice for a teacher, even for for young learners, a teacher for young learners, a diagnosis of needs uh, can be incorporated in the first week of instruction so as to condition them and so as for them to gauge what kind of skill set they have already and what kind of expertise level they have already acquired. So as for the teacher to be guided as well in the teaching process. Furthermore, since we're talking about andragogy, we're talking about here how the learner's experiences will be in the classroom. So one implication will be conducting learning experiences and how the teacher will be adjusting on her or his instruction. So the teacher can choose whether or not it could be didactic or it could be also self-directive instruction to which the learners will discover themselves the kind of knowledge they would want to have. In that case, we can also let them have experiential learning to which we can also tap their experiences so that they could be resources for learning as well. Lastly, we have the evaluation of learning. Since we're talking about adult learners, it would be implied that we would want them to be accountable of their own learning because of their independence on some discussions or some classroom instructions. We would also want them to recognize the changes maybe that they have uh, experienced in the discussion and how they would be relating those experiences to real-life context relating back to their developmental tasks. After our discussion with the concept of the learner and its implication to classroom practice, we now have the role of experience and its implication to our practice in the classroom. We have first the emphasis on experiential techniques and the second is emphasis on a practical application. So the assumption on role of experience is that as people grow and develop, they accumulate an increasing reservoir of experience. And that uh, entails us teachers to recognize that our learners themselves are actually resources of knowledge and information as well in the classroom. In that case, we have the emphasis on experiential techniques to which we can tap the adults' experiences and expose their rich resources for knowledge and their insights on the topic at hand. We, we should also focus as teachers on the activities to tap the experience of the adults such as role-playing, such as recitations, self-reflections, sharing, such as group activities, brainstorming, etc. And we would want them to interact with us based on our guide questions maybe or maybe with our follow-up questions that would elicit uh, personal experiences from them, of course, trying to be as respectful as possible with with those sentiments that they would be sharing. We would also want to foster a very trusting... um, environment and a, and a safe space for our students, accommodating their uh, psychological needs as well to, to interact with others. So in this emphasis on experiential techniques, as adults would be coming into your classroom with enough wisdom already in their lives, we would want those wisdom to be exposed in the classroom so as for the other adults to learn from their colleagues. Much of what is happening in our grad school is that we learn from one another. And that is an example on the implication of the role of experience for us adults. As for me, since I'm still a budding teacher or a beginning teacher uh, for my humble three years, um, I listen very intently to my colleagues whenever they recite or whenever they share their responses. And from those responses, I am able to gather enough knowledge and I I can gather um, enough insight and I would uh, base my actions in the future from those collected um, sentiments from others. And finally, we have emphasis on practical application. Adults' reason to learn is for everyday transactions and social roles. After this slide, we will be discussing already the developmental tasks each person each person has in his life and in this case we would want 
to have activities or instruction to be focused on how to apply learning directly to their lives. Again, uh, as students come into your classrooms and when they are adults, they would want to apply specifically their learning immediately on their social tasks or roles that they, they've left behind uh, when they came into your classrooms. With that being said, we might want to consider as well infusing activities like experiments, field trips, or maybe some experiential techniques like laboratory, uh, laboratory time. Problem-solving cases like maybe simulation could also fit for them based on what kind of expertise they have. Or maybe some types of role play that would discuss how they will be acting out. Um, the specific tasks that they would want to learn on. Just to learn, and in this slide, we are going to discuss already what the developmental tasks are. So in this slide, you're actually able to see the three uh, differing developmental tasks among age groups. We have early adulthood, middle age, and late maturity. And this is from Havi Gerst in 1961. So for early adulthood, for 18 to 30 years old, we have selecting a mate, learning to live with a marriage partner, starting a family. As compared with middle-aged group, we have 30 to 55. They are already achieving adult civic and social responsibility, establishing and maintaining an economic standard of living, assisting teenage children and the like. And for late maturity group, we have greater than 55 years old. We have adjusting to decreasing physical strength and health, adjusting to retirement and reduced income and the like. So what are developmental tasks? A developmental task is a task which arises at or about a certain period in the life of the individual, successful achievement of which leads to their happiness. But for, for failing about these developmental tasks, it would lead them to unhappiness and dissatisfaction. Of course, uh, if, if these tasks are not um, achieved by these groups, there will be all also inevitably a disapproval by the, the by the, the society. All right. Now, those developmental tasks should be considered in the learning instruction of the adult learners inside the educational setting, and it has actually several implications to our practice as teachers. So, as for teachers, we also have to gauge whether if it's timely already for the learners to learn the concept and the discussion or the topic at hand. As curriculum developers, we need to sequence and time the curriculum so as for the curriculum to match the present developmental task at hand. So of course, if the adult learners are coming into your classrooms, they will be bringing with them the developmental task and they assume that the discussion will also be aligned to whatever social role they have. Once again, people become ready to learn only something when they experience a need to learn it. So which is why timing of learning is very important for the teacher as well. And a teacher's job is to also provide tools and create conditions for procedures for helping learners discover their needs to know. And learning programs should be organized around life application and sequence according to the learner's readiness to learn. And finally, we have grouping of learners. So there are several purposes for different groupings. We have homogeneous and heterogeneous groupings. For homogeneous, we would also want to articulate maybe the, the similarities of all members in, in one group so as for them to strength, uh, strengthen uh, the values that they share with one another or to recognize maybe what's beneficial or what best practice would be applicable for this specific task. And finally, we have heterogeneous groupings. These groupings may be applicable for when you might want to enlighten them about the differences uh, on their gender, culture, sex, and age, uh, which would lead them to perfectly adjusting with one another say for example for like tasks like um team building or for other tasks that would elicit 
um, good communication skills from your from your um, students, of course. And finally, we have the last assumption, which is the orientation to learning. So once again, this assumption is based on learners, and they see that education is a process of developing increased competence to achieve their full potential in life. They want to be able to apply whatever knowledge and skill they gain in your classroom to live effectively in their day-to-day -day basis. Accordingly, learning experiences should be organized around comp competency and to develop them themselves. People are problem-based and performance-based as well as compared to children in their in their orientation to learning so which is why there are several implications which are the orientation of adult educators uh, they would be the ones uh, responsible for what the discussion and what the flow will be for the lesson so youth educators can perhaps appropriately be primarily concerned with the logical development of subject matter and its articulation for children. But for, for adults, adult educators must be primarily attuned to the existential concerns of the individuals and institutions they serve. So once again, when adults uh, learn something, they expect, I cannot stress this, this enough, uh, they expect that they will be able to apply these learnings into the institutions they will be coming back to. Second, the organization of the curriculum. We need to also contextualize and specialize uh, subjects to cater to those problem-centeredness of the learners to which they can fully apply new knowledge in the field of their liking. And finally, we have design of learning experiences. So it's not always just the teacher. It's not always just the curriculum developers who would be designing the learning experiences. But also, it would also be the learners themselves who will be connected with the planning and the designing of those experiences lived in your classrooms as uh, the discussion goes. And that's the wrap for my discussion. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've learned something about the trends and issues on pedagogy and andragogy and their impacts in the classroom practice. Again, I am Mr. J.B. Dizon. I hope you have a good day ahead of you. God bless.